Hey everybody, back with another exciting video. This time uh, we are going to be discussing common issues that get encountered with uh, injectable therapy. Whether it be estrogen or testosterone, doesn't really matter. There's some pretty common stuff that happens with just about any kind of injection, but especially hormone injections. Um, so anyways, we have got, uh, the first topic would be uh, redness, swelling at the injection site. So, I mean, of course, you're going to have a little bit of bleeding whenever you do inject because you broke skin. doesn't matter if you're doing intramuscular injection or subcutaneous injection. You may get some blood. You know, you're not going to bleed out or anything. If you do get, like, a good welling of blood, you probably just hit a uh, superficial capillary, and that's what's making it look like a lot you are not going to bleed out from the kind of needles that you're using to do either intramuscular or subcutaneous though, so calm down. Uh, but the swelling and redness can be a normal part of an injection. It just kind of depends. Sometimes it's caused by poor injection techniques, so you just irritate the tissues there and they just react by uh, filling up, uh, you know, swelling and, uh, and or bleeding a little bit. Um, sometimes it can be a small localized allergic reaction. These do often go away with time as your body kind of sensitizes itself to it, um, to the medication and the actual um, mixture that the medicine is in. Uh, you're not going to find yourself allergic to the actual hormone. I mean, that's that's just would be very strange since you produce both hormones, estrogen and testosterone, in your own body. And this uh, should be, anyway, a bioidentical hormone that you are injecting. And uh, what is commonly found is that they are mixed in cottonseed oil, sunflower seed oil, you know, some kind of seed oil like that, uh, that they're suspended in. And that's usually what people are having a reaction to is the kind of seed oil that it's suspended in. And there are things you can do to mitigate that. I mean, you can change the medicine altogether to a different formulation of, you know, testosterone or estrogen. You can get it compounded at a specialty pharmacy to be mixed with something else. Um, some people just deal with it, like if it's very mild and it's not really bugging them that bad, they'll just take a Benadryl like 25 or 50 milligrams before their injection and that helps do it. Um, but if you have an actual allergic reaction, which would be, you know, you start breaking out in a rash all over your body or, you know, you get some kind of swelling there that begins to spread or redness that spreads out, um, that's completely different and that's something that would be kind of a deal breaker probably for those kind of injections and you're going to have to change medications. Um, it's kind of a telltale sign for allergic reactions if there is itching at the site whenever uh, the redness and swelling is going on. Um, if there is no itching, that's not 100% that it's not like a localized allergic reaction, but uh, that is what you commonly see it would be itching. Uh, but the swelling and redness should resolve over the course of a day or two. Uh, you can help it along a little bit by applying like a cool pack on and off to help vasoconstrict and, and kind of get some of that um, swelling fluid out of the area. Uh, and just keeping it clean and dry. You know, don't mess with it. Don't scratch at it or anything crazy like that. Um, and just keep an eye. Make sure you're not exposing it. Like don't have the cat sitting right on top of it or something like that. I mean, we all love our pets, but you don't want their butt sitting on top of uh, an area that's already irritated. But uh, anyways, so that's pretty much it for like swelling, redness, itching, things like that. It's a, a pretty typical reaction that a lot of people get uh, that most of the time will taper off and go away as you go on with your therapy. But if it starts getting worse or it's just, if it's just consistently there, that's one of those things where you need to decide for yourself, is this enough to where I really want to just change what I'm giving myself or is it something I can deal with or you know let me find something else to help mitigate this side effect. Um, the next thing is just kind of a tip is to rotate the sites that you're injecting because if you inject around the same site all the time you can get more of that uh, swelling redness reaction because you're just irritating the tissue stabbing around the same area all the time and depending on how frequent your injections are could make it, you know, pretty bad. I mean, there's some people who do microdosing, who do either dosing every day, every other day, every third day. And if you're injecting the same site at that point, that can get quite annoying to that area. So you want to rotate your sites a little bit. Um, another commonly encountered problem with both E and T is whenever you get it and you're trying to pull it out of the vial or push it out of the syringe when you're giving the injection itself, uh, is that you're having difficulty doing that. And that is actually because the, the medication itself is super thick. As I mentioned before, it's mixed in an oil. And oil is much thicker than the usual watery 
kind of uh, medications you would see, like uh, insulin, you know, is very thin and easily pushed through a tiny needle. Um, but anyway, if, if you think about um, how it could be different than a more watery medication such as insulin, uh, if you think about if you push water through a garden hose, pretty all right, pretty easy, right? Well, try and push oatmeal through it. So it gets a little bit more difficult to push that thick stuff on through there. Uh, the same thing follows with both T and E. They're very thick, um, oily liquids. Whenever you're pulling it out and pushing it in, that's a very commonly encountered issue. It's not something that means you're doing something wrong. It's just like that's almost a normal thing to encounter. Many people will get a larger needle uh, whenever they're drawing it out of the vial uh, to be able to just kind of save themselves the trouble. Like uh, they'll get an 18 or a 20 gauge sized needle. Uh, to be able to pull the medicine out of the vial a little bit quicker and more effectively. Uh, and then they'll take the, the uh, 20 or 18 gauge needle off and put their actual injectable needle on there to administer the medication. Um, not exactly a 100% necessary step, but it does save time. Um, at any rate, so that is normal, I guess you would call it. It's not a problem, you're not doing anything wrong. Uh, another thing I get asked is about bubbles. And uh, people are always freaking out because uh, they'll pull up and there's little tiny bubblets all over in there and they can't get them all out of the vial and whatever. Um, that is fine. Like you can go ahead and inject those suckers straight on in. It's not going to do anything. They're just going to dissipate in your tissues once they're in there. Um, just to give you an idea of how non-harmful uh, bubbles in an intramuscular or subcutaneous injection can be, um, like, oh God, 17, 18 years ago, whenever I first went into nursing school and uh, started getting taught about injections, one of the things we were taught about intramuscular injections was to include a small air bubble in the injection itself uh, so that the idea was, you know, you're going down like this, the bubble would be floating up at the top of the medicine, you inject it, and the bubble is the last thing to go in and that it would form a seal so that your medicine wouldn't come back out. Um, they've since kind of quit teaching that method. I get, you know, they decided it's not really like, it's not hurting anything. It's not particularly helping though. So it's just an extra step that's really not necessary. Um, so, you know, we were injecting bubbles in people back in the day. So, I mean, <laughs> don't be afraid of bubbles. It is okay. You're not going to encounter like a big enough vein or artery uh, in an intramuscular or subcutaneous um, injection that's going to take that bubble and go with it and really hurt you or anything. Um, so anyway, lose the fear of bubbles. It's okay. Um, anyway, some people will uh, ask me about multi-use vials. So they'll get their vial and it says, uh, especially with testosterone, the one milliliter vials, it'll say uh, single use vial. And they always text me and they say, ah, it's a single use, you know, what am I going to do? Some pharmacies will give you enough so that you can use them as single use and then others don't. So where is the line drawn? <laughs> um, so in an unofficial capacity, what I will tell you is that I know so many people, actually, I know no one that actually uses it for a single use vial. Uh, everybody I know uses them for multiple use, you know, two or three times because, I mean, one, tea is very expensive uh, to just throw it away. I mean, it's not like hellaciously expensive, but it's it's costly enough that you, you're just like, oh, I don't want to throw the medicine away. But um, anyways, not to ramble on about costs and everything too much, but, you know, the vial itself, if they label it single use, that just means that the preservative that's in it, you know, they they have decided that uh, once the vial has been punctured that it's no longer going to be considered sterile and there's a possibility for bacterial growth. I would advise you that if you're out there and you're using um, the single use vial uh, more than once, make sure you are not using it beyond 28 days for sure because then, you know, you know that, that could get a little bit hairy with bacterial growth. But um, besides the 28 day thing, make sure that you are cleansing the top of that vial very well. 10 seconds scrub the hub circular motion uh, before you access it with a needle each time. That way you are using absolute sterile technique. Keep it in a clean, dry, cool environment, uh, the vial itself, to, uh, to inhibit bacterial growth. You don't want to leave it like in a 85 degree, uh, 90 degree 
um, desk drawer that always sits, you know, it's always getting direct sunlight. And so the vial is always heating up and cooling down, heating up and cooling down. That's not going to do anything good to the medicine. And it could also uh, possibly lend itself to some bacterial growth within the vial um, if you're so lucky. <laughs> but anyway, so my official stance on Single-use vials is, you know, if the manufacturer says single-use, sure, you really, you know, should use it single-use. Do I know anybody that actually does that? No. But, you know, if you're going to use it as a multi-use vial, just be careful and use some, uh, some common sense stuff. Make sure you're sterilizing the cap before you access it. Make sure it's kept in a cool, clean, dry place. You know, don't let the dog lick it or something crazy. Um, anyways, then some people will tell me that their vial of medicine, either E or T, will say uh, intramuscular use only. So here's the thing with that. What they actually mean, intramuscular use only, is injection only. They don't want you to pop that metal cap off and then drink it. That would be bad. It is formulated and made just to be injected. Um, back in the day, you know, the manufacturer meant these for intramuscular injections because that was what was tried and studied and most commonly practiced. However, over the last 10, 15, maybe even 20 years, uh, subcutaneous injection of uh, hormone therapy has become a lot more common and, uh, and more accepted and preferred even in some places, um, depending on, you know, your, your preference. And so uh, whenever you see intramuscular use only, reinterpret that as injection only, meaning intramuscular or subcutaneous. You can use it either or, it's perfectly fine. Um, but anywho, so let's see, I kind of ran out of my topics and everything. I'll just go over right quick uh, good sites to inject on. Always remember to rotate your sites, never stick in the exact same place. If you're sticking in the exact same place every time, you're going to form some scar tissue over time. And scar tissue is a lot less vascular than nice healthy tissue. And so you're not going to have as many blood vessels going there. You'll have poor absorption rate, yada, yada. Uh, so rotate your sites, you know, uh, left to right, around, whatever, or rotate, change sites entirely. So with regards to subcutaneous injections, most people are going to be familiar with like pinching up a piece of belly fat all across the, the front of the abdomen, over a little bit to the side, up and uh, over and below the uh, belly button. And uh, that's a great site, really easily accessible. Another site you can access is the actual the chicken wing on the back of the arm. You can inject into that nice little fatty thing right there. And then um, I'm not going to stand up because I am short, but I'm not quite you know, the, the right height for this camera to catch the other site. And that's going to be the outside of the thigh. When you run your hand up your thigh towards your butt, there's always going to be this little fatty fat chunk right there. And uh, that's another site you can use for uh, subcutaneous injection. Uh, and then as far as intramuscular injections, um, you will see most commonly people are injecting like their thigh, which is going to be if you look at the top of your thigh and you could draw a line down the middle of it to your knee, it's going to be like about an inch over to the outside uh, part of your thigh and it's a little line around there that's good for injecting. And then, you know, if you've ever got the flu shot or something up here, your deltoid, it's going to be right up there is a good spot. Um, if you were looking at your butt cheek standing behind yourself, looking at your butt cheek, and you could divide your butt cheek into quarters and, uh, you know, well, let's turn this way because it's going to be weird me pointing. So if you're, if you're doing this and you're dividing your butt cheek into quarters, it's actually going to be this quarter, the upper right uh, outer corner. Or if it's your left butt cheek, it's going to be the other side. But anyway, if I was looking at this, it would be the one up here that I would, uh, that I would go for for the injection. That's the, the location that you should be doing intramuscular on. Um, there are other places that you can inject as well um, for both techniques. Those are just the most common, most uh, popular, I guess you would say. Um, you usually find a place that's, you know, works well for you, but if you get a chance to rotate it, it is a good idea, again, for scar tissue and all that good stuff, because, I mean, as you go along, you know, years of injecting yourself, you get quite tired of injecting the same place. Um, anywho, so I hope you enjoyed this wonderful video about commonly encountered issues with injections and whatnot, but, uh, if you have any questions, you know where to find me, just hit me up. All right, see y'all later. Bye.